All right, we can go ahead and get started. Thanks everyone for joining us today. And welcome to today's webinar, Blue Carbon, a new tool for coastal wetland conservation and restoration efforts. Um, today's webinar will be recorded and posted online on our website after today. And so we'll send a link out to the, um, of the recording to all of our registrants. Um, you've all been placed in listen-only mode. So if you have a question, please use the uh, question or chat box in your webinar panel. So my name is Stephanie Simpson, and I'm the Blue Carbon Program Coordinator for Restore America's Estuaries, and I'm going to be your presenter for today. And again, please answer or put any questions in the chat box as we go along. And at the end of the slide presentation, I will cover as many questions as time allows. So the goal of today's webinar is to get you comfortable with blue carbon concepts and ideas. I don't want you to feel hung up when you hear blue carbon, so keep in mind that this is a new and emerging field, and the role of blue carbon can play, um, and the blue, the blue carbon can play a role to support and drive increased restoration efforts. Um, but it is still a very much an open dialogue. So as we go through this webinar, start thinking about how you can use blue carbon to achieve the greatest benefits for your estuary restoration and conservation goals. And I hope that this webinar will increase interest to expand the science and application of blue carbon um, to benefit coastal habitat restoration efforts. Before we delve into blue carbon, I want to give a little bit of background about who we are at Restore America's Estuaries. We're a 501c3 nonprofit that leads a national alliance of 11 community-based organizations dedica dedicated to the protection and restoration of bays and estuaries for our nation. Um, we provide a united voice as we're located in Arlington, Virginia, near our nation's capital. And we're working to further prioritize these important habitats. And you can find out more about us and our different programs online at estuaries.org. So an overview of what we'll be covering today, um, again, this webinar is meant to orient you to what blue carbon is and the benefits and opportunities for wetland restoration efforts. Um, so we'll cover the basics of blue carbon science and how it can relate to restoration and conservation goals, giving you a global context of the ecosystem degradation and impacts. And then we'll share some results of a case study in um, Puget Sound in Washington that demonstrates climate mitigation benefits of restoring wet wetlands. And then I'll move on to uh, more of the meat of this webinar, which will be the basics of the carbon market, how it works, and how wetland projects can be incorporated into the carbon market. Um, and then I'll summarize what priorities and efforts are needed um, to further advance blue carbon opportunities. So estuaries, um, as hopefully hopefully all of you know as you're working in estuary areas, they're, they're some of the most productive ecosystems in the world. Um, they provide us with, with many critical services, have a key habitat for many fish and, and shellfish species with recreational and economic value. They provide shoreline stabilization and protection from storms and flooding and improved water quality. But today we're going to focus on another ecosystem service, one that's relatively new in recognition that wetlands provide and that is blue carbon. So when we talk about blue carbon, um, and you may hear the term coastal blue carbon as well, what we mean by this term is the carbon and other greenhouse gases that are sequestered by, stored in, and released by coastal wetlands. So our salt marshes, mangroves, seagrasses, and other tidal wetlands. Over the past several years, the science on blue carbon has been growing increasingly. We now recognize that coastal wetlands play a significant role as long-term carbon stores. One of the things that makes them so effective is that primary carbon storage happens in the soils. So this graph shows that carbon storage, shows carbon storage um, for the first meter of soil only, realizing that actual depth of, of soil can be several meters um, deep in most ecosystems. And as healthy ecosystems accrete over time, this carbon pool not only increases, but as, um, but as long as the soils remain wet and undisturbed, the carbon can remain locked up for centuries and even millennia. And when we compare this to our terrestrial forests, where they um, store the majority of their carbon and their biomass, um, that stored carbon can stay in there for, for, for decades. So we're looking at much longer uh, carbon storages. So coastal wetlands not only 
um, store significant amounts of carbon, but they also sequester carbon at very efficient rates. Um, noting that this graph it does have a logarithmic scale, um, coastal ecosystems can sequester carbon at rates 10 times or more effectively than our terrestrial forest. And for the past few decades, terrestrial forests, they've benefited a lot from their role in mitigating for climate change. So our hope is that in recognizing the significant role that coastal wetlands play in sequestering and storing carbon, that they can also benefit similarly. So I wanted to give a little bit perspective um, as we're talking about tons of carbon or carbon dioxide equivalents. Um, so here are some comparisons. So a Hummer driving 15,000 miles can emit up to 11 tons of carbon dioxide equivalent, whereas a Prius driving the same amount, about 3.7 uh, tons of carbon dioxide equivalents. But just one hectare of salt marsh can remove eight tons of carbon dioxide every year. So again, these are our significant numbers. Our coastal wetlands are, are really providing a, um, a significant service in climate mitigation. So in most, um, it, when we look at coastal habitat trends in the US, we've lost about 50% of our wetlands since the 1800s. And we've made great strides in conserving coastal habitats in recent years, and we know how to restore them, but restoration is not able to keep pace with losses. A report by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and NOAA on their Status and Trends Report for Coastal Wetland Habitats noted that from 2004 to 2009, the U.S. lost 80,000 hectares a year, or sorry, acres a year, with the majority of that loss happening in the Gulf Coast. In the most of the U.S., we've established science-based restoration goals. We did a review last year that showed that we're restoring just over 1% of the goal that we've set for ourselves, again, barely keeping pace with losses. There are places where we are gaining ground, but on a whole, we are still losing our wetlands nationally and struggling to keep pace with restoration efforts. So we need new and creative ways to increase prioritization of these resources. And again, that's why we're looking at blue carbon. Globally, we're seeing similar trends in habitat loss, losing coastal habitats up to 7% a year. And that equates to economic damages of 6 to $42 billion annually um, using the social cost of carbon. And when we lose these ecosystems, we not only lose the long list of other benefits that they provide, but when those habitats are drained and degraded, the carbon that was once locked up in their soils can now be emitted back into the atmosphere, often at, at very rapid rates making coastal habitats a source of emissions rather than a sink. Roughly half a billion tons of carbon dioxide are released annually due to habitat degradation globally, and that's equal to Canada's yearly emissions. So al although the combined global area of the three, the three coastal habitats, uh, salt marsh, mangroves, and seagrasses, equate to about 2 to 6% of the total area of tropical forest, degradation of coastal habitats accounts for 19% of carbon emissions from global de deforestation. And just think, thinking about this in a different perspective, if, if a business were, was losing its assets at 3% per year, it would take immediate steps to correct the situation. Yet globally, we lose at least that much in these important ecosystems, tens of thousands of hectares each year. And the leading cause of losses is, is human development, economic development, including agriculture, aquaculture, housing, and tourism. Shrimp farms are a huge problem, as wetlands in many countries are destroyed for, for this purpose. And there are conservation organizations working to halt these losses, but thus, thus far it hasn't been enough. So again, one of the reasons why we're looking at blue carbon is to help um, is to help drive their, um, their message for their, for their conservation and restoration. And understanding the totality of benefits that coastal wetlands provide, we should be including climate mitigation in that, recognizing that the loss of that stored carbon, along with other, all of the other ecosystem benefits from habitat loss, and our low restoration rates in the U.S. and elsewhere, we're working to use blue carbon as an additional driver to further prioritize wetland conservation and restoration efforts. And at Restore America's Estuaries, we're working to do this from a number of different standing points. We're working to introduce coastal wetlands into the carbon market to enable carbon finance to support efforts 
This is something I'll be going about going into more detail um, um, shortly in this webinar. We're also supporting science and demonstration projects to expand our understanding of blue carbon, and I'll give an overview of some of this work. And we're exploring policy and regulatory options to incorporate blue carbon into existing policies to help benefit restoration efforts. We're coordinating blue carbon efforts nationally to leverage uh, limited resources, and we're raising awareness and building capacity by holding local and regional training workshops and webinars like this on blue carbon. We're currently involved in presenting a series of full day workshops in the Gulf in partnership with the Gulf National Estuarine and Research Reserves and funding support from the Fish and Wildlife Coastal Program, NARES Science Collaborative, and NOAA Office of Habitat Conservation. Um, so you can keep up to date on these events. You can see past workshop presentations all on our website. You can use the URL below, estuaries.org slash blue carbon. Um, if you happen to be in the Gulf near where we're having one of these workshops coming up um, in Naples and also in, and it's in Naples, Florida, and also in Port Aransas, Texas, um, I urge you to go online and see if, um, and to register for one of those workshops to learn more. So let's look at a study that we conducted last year with NOAA as our lead funder. Um, this study, we worked with our project, funder, our project partners that included Environmental Science Associates, Western Washington University, and Earth Corps. And this study was a first assessment of the carbon fluxes over multiple decades and different land uses for historically drained wetlands and also future restoring wetlands. So soil carbon stocks were determined by collecting soil cores at 12 different sites across the Snohomish Estuary in Puget Sound, Washington. And these sites represented various habitat types, such as emergent tidal wetland, forested wetland, and drain wetlands. And then the soil, and the soil um, carbon and carbon accumulation rates were determined for both natural and restoring wetland sites. Um, and then we also took sea level rise into account. And we wanted to see what, if any, the climate benefit would be for these restoration actions. And the study found that currently, current restoration efforts to restore about 1,300 hectares would result in 2.5 million tons of carbon dioxide removed from the atmosphere over the next 100 years, which would be like taking half a million cars off the road. And if the entire 4,700 hectares of the estuary were to be restored, it would remove 8.9 million tons of carbon dioxide over the next 100 years, which would be like taking 1.7 million cars off the road. So these results clearly demonstrate there is a climate benefit to restoring our coastal wetlands. Um, if you're interested to learn more about these studies, you can visit the URL on the screen. Um, so our next step from the Snohomish estuary study is actually we're taking the same uh, project approach from Puget Sound, and we're currently using this approach in Tampa Bay. And what's really great about Tampa Bay is it's one of the few areas in the U.S. to have all three coastal habitats. So we're able to add seagrasses and mangroves into the study in addition to salt marsh. Um, and the study is being expanded to look at sea level rise adaptation for seagrasses and salt marsh and mangroves, um, and to help coastal managers plan long term for their habitat health. Uh, the Tampa Bay Blue Carbon Assessment will provide a baseline um, and, and predictive model for entry into the carbon markets. The collected carbon sequestration and storage data will be integrated into a GIS model that's being developed. And this model will show several management scenarios with their projected climate benefit. And this will help to better inform and support coastal manager um, their decisions uh, when managing the, their ecosystems and will help to them to identify sites for a prioritization of restoration and conservation actions in Tampa Bay. And this is something that we are hoping will be transferable to other areas in the U.S. and elsewhere as well. Um, and I do have to give a quick you know, shout out to all of our partners in this project. It's a great array of both private, nonprofit, um, and federal partners. Um, it's a really great partnership. We always like to see a diverse array of partnerships involved in, in habitat conservation and restoration and, and estuary science projects. Um, so right now, field data is currently being collected for this study, and we're looking to have the results towards the end of the year. Um, and so be on the lookout for another webinar from us to present those findings, as well as reports coming from that. So now I'd like to switch gears and talk more about carbon markets and the opportunities for coastal wetlands to earn carbon finance. So first, I want to make sure we understand what a carbon offset is and how the carbon market works. 
So a company or individual who would like to reduce their carbon footprint can purchase carbon offsets um, to do so. So these projects um, either remove carbon from the atmosphere or they prevent emissions from happening um, and, those, and then that way they generate carbon offsets and it's one carbon offset or credit is generated for every ton of carbon dioxide or equivalent other greenhouse gas um, that is removed or prevented. So companies then purchase these offsets to meet their reduction goals or to meet the regulations and then the money from that purchase is cycled back into the offset program generating carbon finance to support these same uh, sustainable projects. And so when we think about carbon markets, we generally separate them into two types, compliance and voluntary. So compliance markets um, are usually involve a regulating entity which sets a cap on emissions for certain industries. And then those industries must meet this cap by either reducing their overall emissions or they can purchase allowances or offsets to compensate. Um, in the U.S., we have two such systems that I'll mention, one in California, I think most people are familiar with that one, um, and another in the northeastern states called the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, or REGI, um, although currently I don't believe any offsets are being purchased through that um, scheme. So I'm going to actually use California as an example to show how a compliance market works, um, though keeping in mind that cap-and-trade schemes can vary in how they are implemented. So in California, all major industries and 85% of emission sources must reduce their emissions to 1990 levels by 2020. And so doing this, um, California has actually become the second largest compliance market after the EU. Um, revenues from their allowance auctions have exceeded about half a billion dollars. So every quarter there's an auction for allowances to admit. So companies who can't um, reduce their emissions to reach the cap, they can purchase those allowances. And over time, the number of allowances that are auctioned will decrease. So companies that cannot reduce their emissions, um, and they'll purchase what allowances they can through the auction, or they can also purchase those allowances from other companies who have those allowances and maybe don't need them, um, or they can purchase offset credits. Um, and last year, uh, about $25 million from the allowance proceeds, which uh, were then reinvested into wetland projects that have climate mitigation benefits, um, so we like to call this our first blue carbon funds. Um, although currently the offsets that are allowed in the California market do not include coastal wetlands, some of the offsets that are included are livestock, um, destruction of ozone depleting substances, um, U.S. forestry and urban forestry, and then coal mine methane um, reduction. They're also considering, they're working with um, Brazil and Mexico, considering um, red plus projects, so it's reduced emissions from deforestation and degradation. Um, and then even considering the offsets that are available, they're only allowed, um, industries are only allowed to use those to meet up to 8% of their obligation. So we are hoping that they will include coastal wetlands um, as an offset option in the future, but currently they're, they're not. So since the U.S. doesn't have a national compliance market and not all of us live in California, I'm going to focus more on the voluntary carbon markets. So these allow for the buying and selling of carbon offsets outside of a regulatory system. And in 2013, the buying of carbon offsets was worth about $379 million, which was used to lock 76 million tons of greenhouse gases out of the atmosphere forever. And North America's share of this was $78 million in 2013. Um, the market is anticipated to grow over the next decade, um, and interestingly, the top two reasons um, have been kind of changing in their trend, whereas before the main reason for companies to invest in carbon offsets was to meet corporate social responsibility goals. Now, in addition to meeting um, CSR goals, companies are investing in offsets specifically to combat climate change. So they're voluntarily taking steps to mitigate climate change. And I find this very interesting that this is an upward trend that more and more companies are doing this. Um, and I mentioned um, before that there are several different ways that offsets are produced, um, such as preventing emissions or reducing emissions. Um, so when we're looking at wetland activities, these are included in a category called AFOLU, agriculture, forestry, and other land use. 
Um, and this is actually where the majority of offsets are produced. Um, they're very um, charismatic in a lot of ways because they often have other, co other code benefits. If you think of um, forestry and tree planting, there's obviously other ecosystem benefits to that, um, as there are with coastal wetlands. And these credits usually tend to sell at premium prices as well. So that's a, a good, good for coastal wetlands. Um, in the next slide, I'll get more about standards, but I just want to note that the verified card is the largest issuer of land use offsets. Um, and again, land use offset, that's where our coastal ecosystems fit into um, the carbon market. So let's go over some of our definitions for carbon markets. So we've got our standards. The standards ensure quality and integrity of carbon offsets. They provide the general requirements for projects and guidance on greenhouse gas accounting. And they also set the procedures for validation and verification. Um, there's quite a few standards that are out there. Uh, the ones on the screen, Verified Carbon Standard, American Carbon Registry, and Climate Action Reserved are used a lot in the states. There's also the gold standard um, and CCBD. Um, but uh, we, since DCS is the largest issuer of land use offsets, that is the standard that we have been working with um, to include coastal wetlands. There's also registries which ensure credits are tracked. So when credits are produced, they're assigned unique um, numbers. And this ensures that there's no double counting. And now, finally, we have our methodologies. And methodologies is that's our key component, really, because these this is what provides the step-by-step -step requirements for actually doing the um, greenhouse gas accounting, quantifying the benefits of a project, and making sure that they follow good scientific practice. Um, and you must have a methodology to develop a carbon project for carbon credits in the voluntary market. Um, and methodologies must go through a rigorous approval process through a standard. So for example, with the verified carbon standard, if you develop a methodology, it has to go through two rounds of independent third-party validation um, before it can receive final approval. So that's kind of the, the basics of how the carbon markets are set up. Um, so now I'm going to go into more uh, of how we're incorporating coastal wetland projects into the carbon market. I mentioned um, there needs to be an approved method methodology for the type of activity that you're doing. And you have to be able to show that there will be a climate benefit to your project. So I'll go through some of the steps um, that you would look at to do this. You definitely don't want to start developing a carbon project or you know, decide at the last minute for a restoration project you want to add a, a, a carbon element because um, there's a lot of planning that, goes in, that is involved with this and um, you want to make sure that you will actually be generating credits because not all coastal wetland projects um, will actually have a climate benefit. And we'll talk about that too. So let's go over some of the activities for coastal wetlands that, do, that can um, generate a net greenhouse gas benefit. Um, the first is restoration. So we're talking about enhancing, creating, or managing um, hydrological conditions or sediment supply, salinity, water quality, or maybe even planting native plant communities. Um, so basically restoration, you know, you're talking about increasing sequestration of a habitat. And then the same thing with creating wetlands. Um, this could be by creating wetlands in open water, by adding sediment, or removing impounded water. Um, so you could generate um, increased sequestration, or you could also reduce methane emissions, depending on the project type, um, as um, the lower salinity habitats tend to emit methane, and the higher the salinity um, don't. So if we are um, reconnecting an impounded wetland to um, now have tidal flow and theref therefore increase that salinity, you could be reducing methane and generating credits that way. And then there's conservation or avoided loss. So this is preventing emissions of the stored soil carbon from being released by keeping it conserved within the habitat. And in all cases, you would need to take into account sea level rise, um, a very important aspect that must be included in, when you're talking about coastal wetlands um, and to the project design and implementation. So there are some general project requirements to consider um, when thinking about developing a coastal wetland project. Most standards follow a pretty consistent set of these principles, um, and they really they work to come as close to a guarantee as possible that any offsets that are issued are legitimate and represent a real reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. So first, your offsets must be real, um, meaning using real measurements or accurate proxies 
that have been field verified to show the reduction actually happened. Offsets must be additional, meaning the offsets would have not otherwise happened without this project. You don't want to provide credits for a project that would have happened anyways because then you're not really making gains in greenhouse gas reductions. Um, they also must be permanent. Um, this is especially important, again, when, lo when looking at coastal habitats, coastal zones, because there are additional factors that need to be taken into consideration, like land use change over time or sea level rise over time. Um, you don't want your, your credits to be washed away from sea level rise. So um, there, are, there are ways that you can help do this, mitigate risks of reversal or include a buffer pool of credits. Um, so that you're, you're making sure the credits that are being sold are, are real and um, that they'll be around for a while. Um, and then credits also have to be, or the project has to be verified by an approved independent third party. And the last two, practical, so you want to minimize project implementation barriers and the ownership, whoever is going to be owning the credits needs to be clearly set out in the project documentation, especially when we're talking about land use projects um, such as wetland projects. Um, there's often many partners involved, so everything needs to be clearly defined um, in your project documentation. So let's look at the current state of available wetland methodologies. There's a coastal wetland creation methodology under the verified carbon standard. And this was developed by the Louisiana Coastal Protection and Restoration Authority. There's a methodology for the restoration of degraded wetlands of the Mississippi Delta um, under the American Carbon Registry. And this was developed by Tierra Resources in Louisiana. And there's the Global Tidal Wetland and Seagrass Restoration Methodology and the Verified Carbon Standard. This one was developed by us at Restore America's Estuaries with our partners. Um, and it's in the very final approval. It's completed its two rounds of independent verification. Um, and we are expecting this final approval any day, any week now. Um, and we are urging people to go ahead and start planning their, their restoration carbon projects. And so this is the um, methodology that I'm going to go into more detail about because it is globally applicable. And then in addition to the restoration methodology, we are working on developing a, con a global conservation methodology as well. So let's talk more about this restoration methodology. Um, it's the first of its kind in that it's globally applicable to a wide, um, wide range of restoration activities of coastal habitats, including tidal wetlands and seagrasses. Um, so you can use various restoration activities for this type of project, managing hydrology, improving water quality, salt marsh plantings, um, among others. And then as far as additionality, um, we talked about that before. This is saying that it, this is going beyond business as usual, that this project would not have happened otherwise. Um, so you have to be able to prove that um, it can't be a regulated project because that would have happened anyways, and you're not making greenhouse gas reduction um, really you know, significant gains in that. So um, the good thing about this restoration methodology is we were able to have a standardized approach um, for the US for tidal wetlands meaning that the restoration rate in the U.S. is so low, we talked about that 1% at the beginning of the webinar, it's so low that basically all tidal wetland restoration in the U.S. is already considered additional. Um, so that's, that's one project step that will make it a little bit easier for project developers doing tidal wetland restoration in the U.S. Now, that doesn't mean that other projects can't be considered additional. It just means that seagrass restoration projects and all non-U.S. Tidal wetland projects have to, pro have to follow the project tool that's set out with VCS and the methodology to prove additionality. Um, so this methodology is actually submitted to VCS in December of 2013. And uh, it's gone through its two rounds of, of third independent party um, validation. And again, we are expecting final approval very soon. But you can see um, a draft available online at VCS, VCS's website by searching um, wetlands or looking in their coastal wetland um, category. So I'm going to go into a little bit more detail about how you would develop a project or different things you should be you could be thinking about if you're if you are thinking about developing a project. Um, the first is though we refer to these projects as carbon projects or, or generating carbon offsets. Carbon dioxide is not the only greenhouse gas that would need to be accounted for in wetlands. 
there are three um, primary greenhouse gases to consider. So carbon dioxide being one of them, but also methane and nitrous oxide. Um, these must be accounted for in what we are calling the baseline and the with project scenario. Um, and the greenhouse gas fluxes in wetlands, they can vary a lot depending on different factors like salinity and sediment type. So I mentioned earlier, tidal wetlands with high salinity tend to have uh, negligible methane emissions, whereas freshwater wetlands can have significant methane emissions. Um, so these are important things to consider, um, knowing that not all wetland projects will be suitable for a carbon project. Um, so it's important to perform a feasibility study beforehand to determine if applying for credits is appropriate for your project type. And so in order to generate credits, you need to be able to show that there is a net project benefit. So um, again, you're, you're looking at your baseline scenario, so what it is before the project, and then your with project scenario. Um, and you need to be able to show um, that for all three greenhouse gases, that you, there's a net negative emission in order to claim carbon credits. So this can be achieved by having a lower emission in the project scenario compared to the baseline scenario. Um, or you may start with high emissions in your baseline and then with the project you may still have emissions but you've, reachie you've achieved a reduction so you could still earn credits for that um, reduction compared to the baseline. Uh, and that, an example of that would be again if you were um, restoring tidal flow to an impounded wetland and thereby reducing methane emissions um, from the increased salinity. Um, and I will mention probably the two um, main kind of what we saw that we call a low-hanging fruit for coastal wetland projects. Um, whereas you can gain um, carbon credit from increasing sequestration, those rates often are a lot lower. But if you are reducing methane emissions, methane is a much more potent greenhouse gas than um, than carbon dioxide. And or if you are preventing emissions from happening, so conserving a habitat you're going to get much more bang for your buck in those types of projects, a lot more, um, a lot more climate benefit from those. And so when you're doing your greenhouse gas accounting, there are several different methods for accounting for emission reductions. These methods are set out in the project methodology. Um, for the restoration methodology that we've been talking about, you can include the use of models, um, published data, proxies, default values, and or field collected data. Um, but as blue carbon is still, it's this emerging field of science. So there's flexibility written into the restoration methodology. So if the science is insufficient, the burden of proof is on the project developer to demonstrate the, their, their rigor. Um, so as the science is still evolving, methods to determine carbon storage and sequestration rates they can often be labor and cost intensive. So where local values can be provided, that is preferable, but there are also default values that can be used. Um, there's a default value of one grams of carbon per hectare per year for salt marshes. And then for seagrass and other land uses, um, IPCC values can be used. So this is uh, just an overview of the steps involved for a carbon project. When you're looking at the process um, for developing a carbon project, you would make sure that there is uh, an appropriate methodology for your activity type, so such as restoration or creation. Um, and then you'd perform a feasibility study, looking at if there would be a net benefit to your project. And then if you can show that, then you would go on to develop a project development document. Um, you'd contract with a third party validator to approve of your methods and register with the standard and registry. And then once approved, you can begin earning credits on the voluntary carbon market. So it should be probably clear at this point that embarking on a carbon project, it'll take a good understanding of greenhouse gas offset requirements and of the accounting processes. Um, so, real, uh, so to help you out with this, um, Restore America's estuaries and our partners, we've developed a guidance document to accompany the restoration methodology. Um, this will be released once the restoration methodology has received its final approval. So again, any, any day, any week now. Um, and the guidance document, it'll work to orient project developers who are interested in developing a blue carbon project to the requirements and considerations needed to develop a successful project. So this includes managing risks, addressing sea level rise, 
um, and also a potential to group projects to kind of cut down on some of the validation cost. And we'll be releasing this broadly when that becomes available. So in addition to using the voluntary carbon market, we're also exploring opportunities for blue carbon to benefit coastal wetlands, including integrating into existing policies and regulations. So um, we, we, and I have a study, I'll actually, in the next slide, I'll talk about that more. Um, we're looking at how to help coastal managers um, incorporate blue carbon into their management plans. Um, and we're exploring carbon offsets outside of the traditional market in order to cut down on some of the transaction costs and funnel more of the initial investment into the actual project. Um, but we're also using blue carbon to strengthen our funding request, um, marketing coastal wetlands as habitats that not only provide the slew of other benefits, but also as a way to mitigate for the effects of climate change. Um, we are hoping that this can really strengthen and increase private investment in, in coastal habitat restoration and conservation efforts. And we're always continuing to look for new and creative approaches. Our ultimate goal with all of this is to improve understanding of the full value of coastal habitats so we can better promote them for restoration and conservation. So I did want to mention um, this analysis of federal policies. Um, this was a study performed by our partners at NOAA, um, examined three, um, examined some federal policies as part of their analysis, including the Clean Water Act, the Coastal Zone Management Act, and uh, NERDA, the Natural Resource Damage Assessment Act. Um, and they determined that no new regulations or statutory changes would be needed to incorporate blue carbon into the implementation of these policies. However, because uh, amounts of carbon in these systems and the fact that most of the carbon is stored below ground comes incorporating carbon into these decisions from these policies could be significantly different from those that focus only on the living resources. Um, for instance, there might be greater mitigation ratios in Clean Water Act or greater requirements for damage mitigation in NERDA. So additional analysis would need to be considered before implementing um, to determine what the outcomes, positive or negative, of incorporating, of, of incorporating blue carbon into the policy can have. Um, we are continuing um, looking at this with our, with our federal partners. Um, there's still, there are still some remaining cha challenges to using um, blue carbon in the carbon market. <clears throat> um, the process of validation can be costly, um, which is why we're looking into opportunities to group smaller projects to cut some of these costs. Um, the technical, technical expertise is needed um, to plan and implement a project, um, and even then carbon measuring methods need to be improved with the development of field verified proxies and models to ease accounting burdens. And because of the dynamic nature of, of coastal habitats, um, regional databases, um, sorry, regional databases of carbon storage and sequestration rates would really improve um, abilities to account for carbon in different regions and habitats. Um, the current carbon price is low, um, and on re return on investment could take a few years, um, and so the upfront costs of restoration would still be needed. Um, we've made a lot of advances in incorporating wetlands into the carbon market, but there's a need to leverage this climate mitigation role of coastal wetlands as an incentive to increase private investment in these efforts. So again, um, some other things to consider um, when looking at blue carbon. Um, the price, like I said, the price of carbon is a bit low to fully support activities. The social cost of carbon is about $40, but on the carbon market, it can they're usually around $4 to $5. Now, that's um, an average, and a lot of times these land use projects um, like forestry and, and where coastal wetlands would be as well, they all often go for a premium because they do have co-benefits, um, so it is selling that to, to investors. Um, um, and then the compliance markets, the, the prices tend to be a little bit higher, um, like in the California market, it's about $8 to $12 per ton. Um, and so carbon finance is not going to, like I said, it's not going to fully support a restoration project. But the offset income could support uh, long-term management or monitoring of projects, typically underfunded project elements. So that's something to think about if you're looking at, at planning a carbon project. Um, and again, to cut down on some of the cost, cost sharing is common in land use sector projects, having lots of partners involved. Grouping smaller projects can reduce carbon accounting costs. 
um, and achieve economies of scale. Um, but we're always looking to you know, new creative strategies to maximize carbon benefits. So when we look forward, um, our understanding of blue carbon benefits of coastal wetlands has improved. There still are specific science needs to include, um, like improving um, our understanding of the, the greenhouse gas fluxes across different habitat types and regions, um, sea level rise impacts, uh, what is the fate of carbon after it's being submerged, um, and again, increasing our database of storage and sequestration rates, which one of the ways to do that is through an estuary scale assessment like the one um, that we're doing in Tampa Bay right now and that we've done in, es in Snohomish Estuary. And in connection to the carbon market, um, you know, we really need a pilot project to be able to show how the restoration methodology can work, how carbon finance can be earned, um, how, how to, um, to, to really show proof of concept in planning a blue carbon project. Um, and we are, like I said before, we are working on a conservation methodology as well, as this could um, have uh, a lot of application, especially globally. So as I conclude, I definitely have to thank all of our sponsors for the Blue Carbon work that we do. Um, we're very thankful to have a, a diverse array of such dedicated funders to support coastal wetland science and conservation. Um, so thank you to all our, spender, our, our funders. And I also wanted to recommend a few resources if you'd like to delve further into the world of blue carbon. Um, many of the facts and numbers mentioned in this presentation today can be found from a Pendleton et al. 2012 paper, Estimating Global Blue Carbon Emissions. Um, I mentioned the policy paper, the policy opportunities paper. Um, that's the second bullet there, uh, Coastal Carbon in Existing U.S. Federal Statutes and Policies. Um, and if you're interested in what it takes to develop a blue carbon project, um, these last three resources could be um, very useful for you. The Blue Carbon Template for Coastal Managers, um, which describes significant factors and understanding the ways Coastal Blue Carbon can help managers achieve conservation and restoration goals. Um, the Coastal Blue Carbon Manual, which was produced by um, Conservation International and IUCN, um, that discusses the methods for assessing carbon stocks and emission factors in mangroves, tidal um, salt marshes, and seagrass meadows. And again, the tidal wetland and seagrass restoration methodology is on the VCS website, but all of these resources can be found or linked from our resource page, so the website at the bottom of the, page, of the um, screen. And so with that, I'm going to look and see if there's any questions that we have. And again, a recording of this webinar will be posted online and sent um, out to all of our participants, our registrants today. And if you have additional questions, you can email me at ssimpson.estuaries.org, um, or you can go online to our Blue Carbon website and find additional resources and their information there. So let me just look through some of these questions. Let's see. Um, I see a question about rice cultivation reducing emissions. Unfortunately, I would not be the person to answer that question. <laughs> um, let's see. Um, as far as other policy vehicles um, that can acknowledge the value of blue carbon, um, it can be worked into a lot of, um, of coastal and, and water policies and, and acts. Um, it's just whether or not they would have a positive or negative effect. Um, I mentioned before how some of our wetlands actually, actually um, emit methane with their fresh water. So we wouldn't, that to be, we wouldn't, we wouldn't want that to have a negative effect um, in planning and mitigating for um, freshwater wetlands, they would have some kind of um, greenhouse gas um, benefit or non-benefit. Uh, 
um, the timeline for the development of the conservation methodology. Um, we are in the very early stages of this. Um, we've got a, a team of writers and experts um, together. We'll be meeting end of this year and again beginning of next year to be putting that together, but it's probably going to be um, another year before that um, it can it starts going through the um, validation process, but we can be sure to keep everyone up to date on that. Um, I will recommend that if you go on our website, um, estuaries.org slash blue carbon, we do have a, a blue carbon buzz e-newsletter um, that we send out once a month, and we keep um, updates, you know, as far as the restoration methodology, the conservation methodology, if there's new publications on blue carbon, um, all of that will be sent out in, in the Blue Carbon Buzz as well. So I'd urge you to sign up for that if, if you're interested to um, stay up to date on what's going on. Um, looking at reefs, um, coral or shellfish. Um, so coral reefs actually don't, uh, there's not a ton of science about uh, what the climate benefit would be, but um, there, there is a paper that will be coming out towards the end of this year um, that you know, when you take into effect all the different ways that carbon is absorbed but then also um, emitted, it kind of comes out to be a, a kind of negligible as far as emission reductions for corals. Um, so I don't, I don't really know that they would be able to play a significant role in, in um, CO2 reduction. And the same goes for shellfish as, as well. Um, the, the big aspect of coastal wetlands that you want to think about uh, as far as mitigating for climate change is that they're storing this carbon into the soils. Um, so, that's, so it's long-term carbon storage. Um, and that's where you can start generating credits as well. Um, a question about the voluntary carbon market. Um, the numbers that I mentioned, those are all from the um, status and carbon market report, which is developed by um, Forest Trends. Um, you can go online. Uh, you know, I'm sure you can Google search Forest Trends, or I, I believe I have a, actually a link from our Blue Carbon website to that report as well. Um, I think they have an even more recent report than the one that, that I um, was taking numbers from. Um, I think they just came out with their 2014 report. So if you have questions about any of those numbers, um, those are calculated uh, by Forest Trends. All right, another question, are there validators that are accredited to certify this sector for blue carbon? Um, so validators, standards will um, suggest validators. Um, they do have to be experts in the field that that methodology is being developed. So for instance, the restoration methodology was accredited by people who know coastal wetlands, by experts in that field. Um, does Restore America's estuaries help fund blue carbon PhD projects? Um, we don't have that funding right now. <laughs> that would be great if we did. Um, but I would definitely, uh, I would suggest to that person to look at NOAA funding. Um, let's see. NASA funding, they do a lot of carbon work as well. Just um, be on the lookout, um, and if we hear of anything, then I, that's something that I would put into the Blue Carbon Buzz um, e-newsletter too. Let's see, oh, good question about considering um, proposing the methodology to the UNF triple C for um, other carbon mechanisms such as CDM and JI. Um, as the COP is coming up this year, um, we are working with our partners at NOAA and IUCN and Conservation International and TNC um, so that coastal wetlands will be part of that conversation. It is our hope that, that coastal wetlands will be something that um, is included more and more in climate mitigation talk. Um, the IPCC did release a wetland supplement in 2013. Um, that um, talks about coastal, that includes coastal wetlands for accounting. Um, they're urging nations to use the guidance and give feedback. Um, and actually, there are efforts right now that Restore America's Estuaries is working with um, the EPA and NOAA to develop the, um, to include coastal wetlands into the US National Greenhouse Gas Inventory. Um, so there, there was a meeting this past summer, actually, to start that process. And I believe there'll be some more information about that um, in the coming months. Um, but we'll be one of the few first countries to do that, to include coastal wetlands in our, in our national inventory. And we hope that'll be a big step um, for other nations to also follow suit. Uh, 
have any of the registries approved coastal wetlands for carbon market credits. Um, the registries, as long as you're using an approved methodology, you can register with the registry. Um, and I think the ones I mentioned were, or maybe I mentioned them, APX and market. Um, so you just have to have an approved uh, methodology for your restoration activity um, and, and then have that accredited through a standard. Who is purchasing voluntary credits in the U.S.? Um, that's a good question. Um, I don't have an immediate answer for that, but um, there it is broken down more in the status and trends of the voluntary carbon market report that I mentioned before. Um, they talk about the different industries, um, but I, I, I can't say specifically. I would just urge you to look at that report as well. Low cost or free training programs available for developing countries. Oh, I don't know. I wish I wish I had an answer for that. I would um, I would urge you to look if you're, for developing countries, Conservation International, and IUCN, and the Nature Conservancy. Um, they all have international efforts, and um, especially Conservation International, I know, is including blue carbon and a lot of. Um, they're, we're working in places like Indonesia um, to to look at feasibility of using blue carbon for climate mitigation projects there in the carbon market um, to help benefit um, areas there. Um, Restore America's estuaries, we are nationally focused, so um, we're not really doing a lot of international work, um, but I would definitely urge you to look at, at CI's webpage for blue carbon. They're the ones also who put out the blue carbon um, manual, so methods of um, data collection for blue carbon. So I think that's all the questions. Um, yeah, I think that's all the questions. Um, I thank you very much for joining us today on this webinar. Um, again, if um, something was not answered, if you have additional questions, um, you can email me. Um, my email is on the screen or you can go online to our website. Um, thank you very much for attending today and I hope that you're able to walk away with some new Blue Carbon knowledge and, and thinking about how you can incorporate that in your own conservation and restoration goals.